damaged, broken, hurting, depressed, anxious, obsessed, can't let go, dysfunctional. Who are you going to blame? Your parents. <laughs> it's like the Ghostbusters. But is it justified to blame the parents? Let's start with a simple answer. Absolutely, yes. Absolutely, yes. I will repeat this. And what I'm saying is backed by decades of research, well over 100 years actually, including massive studies such as ACE, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Studies. Parents, the environment they create, nurture, are by far the most decisive and dominant factor in who you're going to become and how happy you're going to go, go through life. And so, yeah, your parents are to blame and to take the credit if you turned out to be a wholesome, relatively healthy, normal functioning person. Now, there's a qualifier here. There are mental health issues, disorders, which have a pronounced hereditary or genetic component. For example, borderline personality disorder, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, um, antisocial personality disorder, especially psychopathy. These disorders are heritable to some extent. If you have relatives with these disorders, you're far more likely to develop it later in life. Similarly, neurobiological problems, brain abnormalities, structural and functional, lead to the development and manifestation of certain, certain mental health disorders. No one is disputing this. However, genetics is a predisposition. Genetics is a potential. Your parents have the key to unlock this potential. So if you are genetically predisposed to develop a mental illness, it is your per parents' behavior or misbehavior, the environment that they have created, which are conducive to the development of this mental illness. They kind of activate your genes. They express them. So all in all, the answer is a resounding and overwhelming yes. Parents are responsible for the mental health of their children. Up to age 36 months, it's the mother's role, and she is the dominant, and she, is, she decides. She makes the decisions and the choices which shape the child to become later an adult with attachment disorders, personality disorders, you name it. At age 36 months, the father takes over until six or nine years old. So it's a collaboration, it's a joint venture between mother and father at different stages of development. And they make you who you are. And this is precisely why abuse and trauma and mental illness are intergenerationally transmissible. They're transmitted from one generation to, to the next. There's a transmission mechanism here. And this transmission mechanism is also known as parenting. This is the topic of today's video. My name is Sam Vaknin. I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, a former visiting professor of psychology and currently on the faculty of CIAPS in Canada, United Kingdom and Nigeria. Let us delve right in. But before we go there, I'm sorry, before we go there, allow me to answer two questions that you've asked repeatedly. Number one, you asked me, narcissists are triggered by films. These questions have to do with previous videos that I've posted. Narcissists are triggered by films. What about music? Music triggers the narcissist, but the triggering here is of a much more primitive kind. Music reminds the narcissist of his early childhood and training by, yes, the mother. So music resonates with the mother's voice which 
in early childhood has entrained the narcissist, deformed his mind or her mind and made the narcissist to what he is. So this is the first question. And the second question had to do with, with uh, my video on three ways to navigate your life, uh, spaces and so on. The thesis in that video is that the brain perceives physical space, social space, your biographical space, your life, your biography, and your inner internal space. The brain perceives all of these as spaces. And all of these are tackled by a structure in the brain known as the hippocampus. And the hippocampus can't tell the difference between a physical space, a real space, an imaginary space, a paracosm, a fantasy, your life, etc. And the hippocampus uses memories the same way we use landmarks, physical landmarks in a foreign city, as tourists, for example. So the hippocampus uses memories as landmarks, as signposts, and navigates using these memories in order to create a coherent space. Now, the self, for example, is this kind of space. Your identity is this kind of space, because it is comprised of memories within a narrative narrative that is perceived by the hippocampus as spatial and temporal. The hippocampus navigates time itself as a kind of territory, as a kind of space. And for more, go back to the video and listen again, watch it again, and I hope this time it will make some sense. And from the hippocampus to your, to your parents, now, I have several videos on this channel which deal with good parenting, good enough mothers, for example, and bad parenting. One of the videos is titled, Tongue in Cheek, How to Create a Narcissist. So, I have dealt with these topics before, but today I'm going to go a bit deeper. I'm going to demonstrate to you how the parents' mental illness or mental health problems are reflected in the emerging personality or self or ego, whatever you want to call it, of the child. How does a resonance of pathologies, and this resonance creates the child. The child is formed out of the resonance with his parents' character, temperament, personality, and unfortunately, in many cases, mental illness or mental health pathologies. So let's start with the issue of boundaries, breach of boundaries. There are two ways to breach the child's emerging nascent boundaries. One way is via brute force, aggression of some kind. It could be physical aggression, could be sexual aggression, these are the, could be verbal aggression. These are the classical forms, psychological abuse. These are all breaches of boundaries. The parent does not allow the child to develop firm, communicated, non-breachable, non-permeable boundaries. The boundaries that later define the perimeter of the integrated or constellated self. So the parents annexes the child, appropriates the child, objectifies the child, treats the child as an extension or a tool. These are all classical forms of breaching boundaries. But there's another way to breach boundaries, to neglect the child, to abandon the child, to be absent, to don't, to don't mind the child. Andre Green called it dead mother. When you don't pay attention to the child, you don't provide the child with a kind of feedback or pushback that allows the child to realize where he stops and you begin communicating your own boundaries to the child, paying attention to the child, uh, hovering around the child, hovering around the child, being present for, for the child. These are all critical in boundary formation because the child says, here's mommy, she is here, 
and this is where she stops and I begin. But what if mommy is never there? What if she is depressed or selfish or sick or physically absent or emotionally absent and so on? The child is unable to develop boundaries because his boundaries are endless. They're not limited by anything. They become infinite. Yes, you're right. This is known as psychosis or narcissism. Narcissism is the flip side of psychosis. In both psychosis and narcissism, there is an egregious breakdown of boundaries and a, consequently a total confusion between internal and external objects. Now, the child who is exposed to bad parenting can adopt one of two strategies, appeasement or rebellion. If the child regards the parental figures as godlike, he would expect the wrath of the gods. He would, expect, he would expect their aggression, their rage, their punitive measures. Their, so what he would do, he would try to appease them the same way Chamberlain tried to appease Adolf Hitler in 1938. The child would negotiate and compromise with the parent by actually minimizing himself or herself the child would vanish gradually, would disappear into the parent, would merge and fuse with the parent as a form of ultimate appeasement. Mommy, I don't exist anymore. You don't need to be angry at me. You don't need to, be, you need to worry about me. So this is appeasement. The rebellion strategy is also a form of merging and fusing with the parent via a mechanism known as internalization introjection. The child identifies with the parent, with the abusive, traumatizing, absent parent, and incorporates her into himself. Rather than becoming a part of mommy, this kind of child makes mommy a part of him. It's reverse, reverse appeasement, if you want. So it's rebellion. The child is the locus of the merger and the fusion, while in the appeasement strategy, which is typical of people pleasers and codependents, in the appeasement strategy, the child vanishes and reappears inside the mother or the father later. In the rebellion strategy, the child annihilates mother and father in his own mind and absorbs them, becomes one with them. And in this case, in because of this, because of this stratagem, he also becomes infallible, omnipotent, and omniscient, like mommy and daddy. By absorbing mommy and daddy, he becomes a god. It's a process of apotheosis. So this is typical of children who go on to become, in adulthood, antisocials, psychopaths, or narcissists. These are the two strategies. Parents who are mentally ill or mentally dysfunctional, mentally unwell. These kind of parents react to the child's strategy. Whether the child appeases them or rebels against them, they're likely to react because they're not well. They don't have their own boundaries. They are unbounded. They don't have impulse control. They are defiant. These parents are defiant. They are reckless. They act out. They are dysregulated. <laughs> They're not well. So, and they themselves, these kind of parents, are usually highly immature. Essentially, they are children as well. So there is a battle, battle of the galaxies. There's a war that starts within the household. And the parents deploy, this kind of parents, bad parents, deploy a host of primitive infantile defense mechanisms against the child. The child, never mind how precocious, never mind how intelligent, never mind how well developed, the child is defenseless against the parents' defenses. The child doesn't have the life experience and doesn't have the mental structure. The child doesn't have, even have the brain. The brain continues to develop up to age 25. So the child 
there's a power asymmetry here and parents who are mentally ill are going to take advantage of this power asymmetry to smother and suppress the child, mold the child, sculpt the child, shapeshift the child, render the child into exactly how they want him or her to be. There's so much putty in their hands. And one of the major, perhaps the main, defense mechanism used by parents against their children is splitting. By misbehaving, by mistreating the child, abusing the child, and traumatizing the child, the child is faced with a dilemma. The child can say, my mother is evil, my father is sick, but then this is terrifying because the child is dependent, dependent on mommy, child is dependent on daddy for food, for shelter. The child can't, can't just say mommy is bad because if mommy is bad, the child is going to die. Mommy is not going to feed the child. Mommy is not going to shelter the child. Mommy is not going to protect the child. Mommy is not going to help the child and the, ch and the child will die. So the child can never say, can never attribute badness, can never say mommy is evil. Instead, what the child does, he splits the parental figures. He splits mommy. This is an all bad mommy and all good mommy. And the child internalizes the all bad mommy, the all bad part. The child becomes a bad object. This mommy remains all good. The child becomes all bad. It's a defense against acknowledging and realizing that it is money that is bad, or at least that there is a part of money that is frustrating and withholding and, and avoiding and absent and bad. The child cannot admit this, cannot accept this. So the child would rather say, I am all bad. It's all my fault. I am unworthy. I'm ugly. I'm stupid. I'm provocative. I'm the one who is responsible for what's being done to me. Of course, when the child uses the splitting defense mechanism, which essentially is imported from his parents, the child, the child assumes his parents' splitting mechanism. He is kind of infected by it. It's contagion of splitting. So when the child does this, he is unable to integrate. He is unable to integrate people because he is used to seeing mommy as all good and himself as all bad. He's going to continue throughout life dividing people to all good and all bad, dividing situations to all good and all bad, catastrophizing. The future is all bad. The past is all good. Splitting takes over. This kind of child grows up to be an adult who is not integrated and in extreme cases disintegrated because of the splitting, constant splitting defense. Bad parents also use projection. Every human being has parts of himself or, or of herself, traits, behaviors, thoughts, emotions, qualities that we are ashamed of, that we would rather not admit, that we deny, that we refrain. Parts of us that are embedded in some kind of self-justifying or self-victimizing narrative. I'm a victim, you know. So all of us have these parts that we wish to disown, parts of us that we wish to discard. We think we would be much better people without these parts. And so one of the main infantile defense, early, early childhood defense mechanisms is known as projection. We project these parts. We attribute them to other people. If I'm weak, I would say that you are weak. If I'm abusive, I would blame you for being abusive. I'm projecting everything that I am and that I'm ashamed of and that I wish I weren't. I'm projecting onto you. I'm attributing to you. I'm blaming you. So this is known as projection. But here's something very important 
that all the scholars have missed because I've read everyone and they all missed this. Projection in childhood, when the child is subjected to projection, it always become, becomes projective identification. Children never experience projection. They always experience projective identification. Now, to remind you, what is projective identification? Projective identification is when I project my shameful parts, the parts that are rejecting me, I project them onto you and you collude with me, you collaborate with me, you embrace these parts of me that I've projected onto you. You develop, you develop the self-belief that you are what I say you are. So if I'm actually a weak person, I would accuse you of being weak. And in projective identification, you would accept it. You would say, yes, I'm weak. This applies to many, many fields of life. For example, homophobia. If I'm a latent homosexual, latent gay, and I'm ashamed of it for some reason, because of my upbringing or whatever, I would say that you are gay. And in the process of projective identification, you would accept it and you would say, yes, I'm gay. But the child is so helpless, so defenseless. There's such a massive power asymmetry. There's such dependency that the child always accepts the parents' projections. The parents are perceived as godlike, infallible. They never make mistakes. And so when the parents project onto the child rejected parts, parts that they're ashamed of, traits and behaviors and thoughts and emotions that they would like to disown, they project them onto the child, they throw them at the child, the child adopts these parts, adopts these behaviors and traits and emotions and cognitions. The child makes these his own. He identifies with them. He becomes, he becomes these parts of his parents that his parents have rejected. Every projection in childhood is automatically and exclusively projective identification. The child trusts the parents, believes the parents, regards the parents as all good, all knowing. And so if the parent tells the child you're weak, the child has no resistance and is likely to adopt this view of himself and then behave this way, behave as a weak person. If the parent tells the child you're stupid, the child has no defense against this. The child is going to adopt this view of himself as stupid or ugly or worthless or bad or evil. The child is going to adopt this view. These parts of the parents that they projected onto him or her, the child is going to adopt these parts and become these parts. In childhood, all projection is projective identification. And these parts, these traits, these cognitions, these emotions that the child had adopted from the parents remain with him or with her for life, well into adulthood. So this is the second mechanism that bad parents use against their children. Now, it's not, it's not premeditated. There's no cunning or skimming here. Oh, wonderful, I have a child. I'm going to destroy it now. No. These people, I told you, these parents are dysregulated. They're mentally ill. They can't help it. Many of these, many of these defense mechanisms are actually unconscious. Okay. The next form of damage that such a parent does, a bad, a bad mother, a bad father, is social isolation, isolating the child, preventing the child from interacting with peers, with role models, with the external environment, with reality itself. Social isolation is also denying the child the friction with reality, which is the main 
engine of growth, personal growth, and personal development. Reality provides very crucial feedback in childhood. And it is a feedback of boundaries. It's the feedback of being right and wrong, trial and error. Being in touch with reality without any cosseting or overprotection or smothering or spoiling or pampering or idolizing or pedestalizing. Being in, in touch with reality without any of these abusive tactics is very important. But bad parents isolate their children. And they create in a child what I call self-referential isolation. Because the child has no access to reality, to other peers, to role models, to teachers, to family sometimes, to the neighborhood, to he doesn't have any access to any kind of feedback or input from the environment. The child becomes his own referent. He becomes his own frame of reference and point of reference. So the child begins to consult itself. <laughs> the child talks to itself. The child becomes his own or her own friend. And, but remember, when the parents are mentally ill or unwell, the child has a bad object. So when the child keeps referring to himself, he is actually interacting with and consulting with a bad object. And this negative, this bad object, is inflated. So there is a problem here. The child cannot access reality or society or his peers because his parents isolate him. They don't allow him, very often physically, don't allow him to exit home, for example. And so this kind of child would withdraw inwards. In negative self-referential isolation, the child would consult or consort with or befriend his own bad object and would become worse and worse. The bad object would become inflated. The child's energies, cathexis, would be inwardly directed and imbue the bad object with powers and qualities that allow the, would allow the bad object to take over the child. And this is psychopathy and narcissism. Similarly, another type of child that is socially isolated, subjected to splitting and projection and bad parenting, another type of child may interact with, befriend, associate with um, his ego ideal is impossibly inflated and grandiose self-image. This kind of child is pampered and smothered and feels entitled. Feels entitled. So he will, he, he becomes associated with his false self, grandiose false self, in order to merge and fuse with the false self. But here's the thing. The expectations, the demands of the ego ideal, the script of the scenario this kind of child is subjected to, the unrealistic expectations, the crazy demands, set up the child for failure. So the, the ego ideal, the false object, also becomes a bad object, owing to constant defeat, collapse, and failure. Now, whew, the, this segment is complicated even for me. I want to explain it again. When the child is socially isolated, the child cannot interact with peers, with role models, teachers, grandpa, grandpa, grandma, I don't know. Child is isolated. So the child begins to interact with itself. He cannot interact with anyone out there, so he is interacting with himself. But inside, inside such a child, there, are, there is an object. The object could be a bad object. 
you're unworthy, you're stupid, you're ugly, you're failure, you will never amount to much. You're, so one group of children have a bad object inside. And by interacting with the bad object, they are empowering the bad object. They are inflating the bad object. And they become narcissists and psychopaths. Another group of children, they don't have a bad object. They have an ideal object, a crazily good object, impossibly good, with expectations and demands that are impossible to fulfill and to meet. And so they fail. These kind of children measure themselves against the ego ideal, against this inflated internal object, which is ideal, perfect, brilliant, amazing, handsome, and so on. So they can never measure up to this kind of internal object. So this internal object also becomes a bad object because it becomes associated with failure, defeat, and collapse. To cut a long story short, children of mentally unwell parents who are also consequently bad parents always end up with a bad object. Either it is a bad object which is antisocial in many ways, because it's bad, you know, or antisocial, evil even, or it's a bad object that is a failure, a defeat, a collapse, because the child can never measure up to the expectations and demands and wishes and dreams of, his, of this internalized ideal object that was implanted in him by the parents. In both cases, there is a bad object. The end point is always a bad object. Another, in, another outcome of social isolation, so the first outcome is self-referential isolation, yeah. but another outcome is an impaired reality testing. It's a muscle. Use it or lose it. If you are not allowed to interact with reality in an unfiltered, unprotected manner, if you're always isolated, cosseted, overprotected, not allowed to engage in any intercourse and discourse with anyone ever, either because you are superior to everyone or because you are inferior to everyone, bad object or inflated fantastic ego ideal, the false self, for, for both reasons, doesn't matter. The end result is you gain no experience with reality. And so you begin to misjudge reality. You begin to misevaluate reality. You get it wrong constantly. And this is known as impaired reality testing. As these children become adults, they begin to rely on other people for reality testing. They can't do it themselves. They don't have this capacity. The muscle of reality is atrophied. It's never been put to good use or any use in childhood. So they have to rely on other people to inform them, to give them information about reality, reality testing. So the borderline, for example, would use her intimate partner for the ego function of reality testing, she would ask the intimate partner, do you think it's real? Do you believe that? Do you trust him? She would use her intimate partner as a reference point, as an encyclopedia, as Wikipedia, as a source of, if I want to get a grasp of reality, if I want to be certain that what I'm seeing, what I'm hearing is accurate and correct, I will ask my intimate partner. The narcissist, on the other hand, needs other people to tell him that his false self is not false, that his shared fantasy is not a fantasy, it's reality. His false self is real. It's, out, it's, it's absolutely him. It, he is not misrepresenting himself. He's not grandiose, he's not inflated, he's not fantastic. So he also needs other people. The narcissist also needs other people for reality testing. He wants them to lie to him. And this is known as narcissistic supply, but it's about reality. He wants them to restore his trust 
in his internal reality as the false self. He wants them to convert his fantasies into elements of reality. So he is also dependent on other people for reality testing. The situation is even much more complicated. If the parents, the mentally unwell, mentally dysfunctional, disordered parents, have more than one child, because they encourage sibling hierarchies and sibling competition in an extremely unhealthy way. They have favorites, golden child. They have scapegoats. They have fixers and healers. They have geniuses. They, they assign roles, emergent roles. So these kind of parents engage in a theater production. This is known as role theory. And I have a video dedicated to role theory, by the way. So they engage in a theater production where every one of the children has his own role assigned to him. It's a rigid role. It's a fixed role. And there's no way to, to ignore it or to avoid it or to, or to correct it or to amend it or to, to somehow mitigate it or ameliorate it. Nothing. You can't do anything. Once the role has been assigned to you by the bad mentally unwell parents, that's it. You're stuck and you're effed. So there's a lot of rivalry, competition, and bad blood between the siblings. The parents encourage it in a kind of divide and rule by establishing hierarchies which are not merit-based, they're arbitrary, and they reflect the pathologies of the parents, so they're also ever-shifting. Today you're on top, tomorrow you're, you're the underdog. This enhances the parent's power. It's only the parent, parent can allocate roles and only the parent can decide at any given moment whether you're, you're on top or whether you are trampled at the bottom by other siblings. Mentally ill parents abuse their children, leverage them, make use of them as battering rams, as instruments against each other. They encourage internecine turf warfare between the children. In this way, they gradually create a cult. Because everyone in, in the household is a member of the cult, and the parents are the cult leaders. Often one of them is a cult leader. It's known as folie à deux, or at the time it used to be known as shared psychotic disorder. So households with mentally ill parents resemble cults. They have cult dynamics and require interventions which resemble very much cult deprogramming. The cult structure enhances all the parental defenses. For example, the cult allows the parent to split the world. We are all good. Everyone out there is all bad. Other people are wrong. They're the enemies. They will never understand us. They're evil. We must protect our secrets. We behave in ways which are morally superior to everyone else. So this is a form of splitting. All the defenses that I've mentioned are amplified a hundredfold by the structure of the cult in which the child finds himself embedded. The child, consequently, is instrumentalized. Now, sometimes the child is instrumentalized by being idolized and adulated and smothered and pampered and pedestalized. It's a form of abuse as it converts a child into a tool, an object, subject to expectations that are so unrealistic that a child is always in a state of failure and collapse and defeat. And this is, this is accomplished, the instrumentalizing and objective, the instrumentalization and objectification of the child are accomplished via coercive snapshotting. To remind you what is coercive snapshotting, Mentally ill parents, especially narcissistic parents, borderline parents, and so on, they take a snapshot of other people. And they continue to interact with the snapshot. 
They continue to interact with the internal object, with the introject, with the photo. They Photoshop the snapshot. They convert the snapshot into an idealized snapshot. And then they force you to conform to the snapshot. If you dare to diverge from the snapshot, deviate from the snapshot, contradict the snapshot, disagree with the snapshot, you're penalized. It's the same with the children. Children of mentally ill parents are being snapshotted. The parents create an internal object of the child. And then they continue to interact with the internal object. And the internal object is perfect, is ideal, is amazing. Because the parent is perfect and ideal and amazing. There's no way an ideal and amazing and perfect parent can have a less than ideal, imperfect child. So the child is forced to conform, coerced, shoehorned, being punished if he fails, to conform to the snapshot. And the child feels like he's dying. He's not treated as a separate human being. Mentally ill parents don't do separateness. They, these kind of parents usually failed in their own childhood to separate from their own parents. So they never experience separation individuation and they don't allow their children to separate and individuate as well. They don't recognize their children as separate from them. And so the child gradually dies because his external separate existence is not recognized via the parental gaze. That's precisely where the child creates the false self. Sometimes this kind of child, because it is so idealized, the child is so idealized and is conceived of or rendered perfect and godlike in the eyes of the adulating parents, this kind of child would be expected to behave as the parents do. Allow me to explain this, because these are really sick mind games. The parents are mentally ill. So they would normally, in, in the vast majority of mental illnesses, they would, cons they would have an unrealistic view of themselves. They would often consider themselves as ideal or perfect or fantastic or amazing or whatever. And so they would expect the child to be like them. They would expect the child to also be amazing and fantastic and fascinate, fascinating and incredible and unique and so on. These expectations would be communicated to the child all the time. And so the, the message the child would receive is, I'm your mother and you need to be like me because I'm perfect and I'm brilliant and I'm drop dead gorgeous and I'm super intelligent and I'm unique and you need to be like me. But the child is a child. So what the message the child is receiving is, you need to be a mother. If the child receives a message from mommy, you need to be like me, the child interprets this message, actually misinterprets this message. You need to be a mother to me. As I am a mother to you, you need to be a mother to me. And this is known as parentification. Parentified children, when they grow up, they feel that they are never good enough. Because a parentified child is still a child. A parentified child is bound to fail as a parent. Never mind how hard the child tries, it's, he's bound to fail as a parent. So the parental role of the child, the parentification of a child, is intimately and intricately linked to failure and the pain of failure, the hurt of failure. So these people grow up and as adults, they feel that they're failing. They, they feel constantly that they're never good enough. They should aspire and strive to do better. They're driven, not by ambition, but a, by a sense of inadequacy, sense of vulnerability. And they also feel that they are responsible for other people's welfare, the same way they have been held responsible for the welfare of their own parents. Now, Ironically, parentification guarantees that a child will never grow up, will never mature. Because again, the message the child is receiving is, 
you are perfect as you are. I am your mommy and I'm perfect and you should be like me. So you should become a mommy also. You should parentify yourself. But you should parentify yourself, my child, as you are. So the child's message is, I am perfect right now. Any evolution, any growth, any development is going to make me less than perfect. This is why narcissists, for example, are very resistant to treatment. Because any change is less, never more. Any change is for the worse, never for the better. The narcissist's inception point, the narcissist's starting point, the narcissist's boundary condition is, I'm perfect. I'm 100%. What can I be more? Than, can I be more than 100%? No way. So anything I, I do, for example, if I try to change myself, I'm likely to end up being 99%, 90%, God forbid, 60%. I'm 100%. I should stay as I am. And this is the parentifying message. The message is, listen, my child, you're a perfect, ideal child. Because you're perfect and ideal, you are like me. I'm also perfect and ideal. I'm your mother, and I'm also perfect and ideal. We are both perfect and ideal. This is the cult element. So we don't need to change. I don't need to change as your mother because I'm perfect. I'm perfect and ideal. And you don't need to change as a child because you're perfect and ideal. And this leads, of course, to lifelong immaturity, regressive infantilism, imaginary friends such as the false self, paracosms, fantasies as virtual reality, not only a defense, but a substitute, a substitute for reality, and then attempting to coerce other people into the fantasy, to share it with them by transforming them into internal objects, obedient and submissive within the fantasy. And everything I'm describing could be put in two words, ego failure. Ego in the Freudian sense, not in the nonsense online. The nonsense online is to have ego is to be proudful. To have ego is to be vainglorious. To, be, to have an ego is to be arrogant and haughty. This is online nonsense. Get over it. This lecture and this channel are academic. We deal with scholarship, not with self-styled experts and coaches who have no idea what they're talking about. Okay? So when I say ego failure, I'm referring to ego as it is defined in psychoanalytic and later psychodynamic and object relations literature. Ego. Ego has multiple functions, and I have a video here on this channel dedicated to ego functions. So everything I've just described leads results in ego failure. There's no integrated or constellated self. They're just fragments. They're not even, they're not even self-states. If you want to adopt my view or Philip Bromberg's view, that there is no self. There's only an assemblage or a troop of self-states. The narcissists or children who grow up with severely mentally ill parents, they don't even have self-states. They have shards and fragments in a kaleidoscope that is driving them literally insane. This ego failure, this failure at ego formation, renders the child who has been exposed to multiple adverse childhood experiences, renders this kind of child into a non-starter, a non-entity, I'm sorry to say, Definitely not fully human, not fully formed, not fully fledged, half-baked human. Now, this is politically incorrect. And many of you are furious at me when I say this. It happens to be the truth. So, this is the picture. I've given you a deeper background as to what mentally ill or mentally unwell parents do to their children, even when they love them, even, they, even when they mean no harm even when they think they're doing the right thing. Their mental illness, their mental health problems, their mental health disorders, 
are going to resonate with the child's emerging personality to the point that it will be deformed, dysfunctional, and finally and ultimately dead. And that is precisely the reason I don't have children. <laughs>